Amen. Glory to God. Now, we know that Paul's letters were powerful. Amen. We know 
that the letters that Paul wrote meant something. So let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you. We thank you on this morning. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you, Lord God, that the word that you're about to release from your servant is going to be a good right now ready word that's going to fall on good ground that's going to bring life, that's going to bring understanding, that's going to allow us to understand who is our true and living God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for today. We thank you for showing up. We thank you for showing out. My God, my God, my living God, my God of Abraham, my God of Isaac, my God of Jacob, David, the lineage through Jesus Christ. We give you the glory. We give you the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I tell you what, this book of Colossians, my God, was so interested in studying and reading. Even though we have read the book of Colossians over and over again, but I tell you, as I read the book again, my God, it began to give me new revelation. Amen. Because don't you know, can I get some volume on this one? Just in case. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. It began to give me some revelation because this book also talks about the mysteries of Christ. Paul began to allow them to understand the mysteries of Christ. Amen. The mysteries of our Lord and Savior. So this book is a book that we're not going to zoom through real fast because, see, this book here is going to cover a lot of topics that I believe in this day and time that we need to understand about the supremacy of Christ. Amen. Most of us have forgotten that he died for us. Amen. And I know we say that he died, but I'm talking about the way that we continue to live our lives, even as leaders. Amen. So the supremacy of Christ is very important. And this is what Paul wrote in this letter. And he began to talk about the riches of the hidden mysteries in Christ in you. See, you don't even know the treasures that you carry in you because if you are endowed with the Holy Spirit, Hallelujah. That means that Christ is in you. So the mysteries of Christ is in you. But the thing is, you got to be able to grab within and pull out those hidden mysteries and revelations through the spirit so that the Lord can continue to speak to you and move you. Because a lot of us are still stuck. Stuck in a place where God has moved us from, but because we're getting so comfortable with the norm and want to do things the way that we want to do things, and in this book, Paul began to talk about how the false teachers become, began to come in and teach heresy that was against the will of God. So even most of us have allowed other people to put things into our spirit when we know that it's not the true and living God, that it's not even in the Word, but because it makes us feel good at that particular time. We have accepted done, amen, which is man knowledge. And also in this book of Galatians, it's going to talk about freedom from our human regulations because a lot of times we are in bondage. You know, we have been set free. We have been released from the bondages when Jesus died for us. No longer do we have to be in chains and shackles, but we are free. Free indeed, so the hidden mysteries of Christ within us needs to come forth. See, the, there's a kingdom in you, amen. The kingdom of God shall be, is, shall be in you. It, it should be in you. So nobody should have not put the kingdom of God in you. It should be already in you, amen. You should already be kingdom-minded, amen. And it also talks about the freedom from tradition. You know, a lot of times we are so still stuck in tradition and religion. You know, even though we say that we've moved in and we do a little prophetic here and a little prophecy there, but really our minds are still caught up in the tradition and the religion of man when God is saying that we need to pull out the hidden mysteries in Christ in us and move in the revelations and the apostolic 
anointing that we should be walking in in this time and day. That's why Paul was very successful in his ministry because he understood apostolic principles. Amen. He understood the prophetic. He understood how to bring the mysteries and the treasures of Christ within him out from within into the earthly realm. Amen. So that he was able to live in the fullness of Christ. Amen. And to live a holy life. To be able to write a letter and allow that letter to be as powerful as it was so he was able to instruct even the, the ministries in prayer, amen, because most of his letters always ended in a prayer as well to the church praying for their well-being praying for their state, praying for financial breakthrough, praying that God keep them steadfast unmovable and always about in the Lord praying these things to keep them strong, amen, so even as we go into the book of Galatians I just wanted to give you a backdrop to let you know that before Paul wrote this letter to the Christians in Calis, he had never been to this city. See, Paul had never visited here. He never done a revival. He never had, he never stood one foot in this ministry, but one of his brothers, amen, in the gospel, amen, his name is Ephesus. He came and he began to, to tell Paul about this ministry and how they are allowing these false teachers to come in and teach them heresy and things that's outside the will of God. So there was a lot of heretical teachers who, inf who infiltrated the church with some dumb, meaning man knowledge. Amen. See, this was during Paul's first imprisonment in Rome. Amen. So Paul began to write a letter. My God, I told you the power and the pen in the letter because the Holy Spirit that rested in him. See, that was the hidden mystery, that treasure that rested in him, that he was able to bring it out within through the pen on the paper and begin to move some things. Amen. And as he began to pin this um, letter to the church of Collision, amen, Colossians, there was a report. Amen. That they were still struggling in their Christianity because they continued to allow these false teachers to teach these heresies in the church. Amen. See, this came from his brother Ephesus. Again, I, I say this because he was the he was one of the leaders of the church. Amen. At Kalesh. Amen. He was there as a converted Paul, and he was there even two years in the ministry in Ephesus with Paul. So he had a good relationship with Paul. So he knew that Paul just didn't talk the talk, but Paul walked the walk. He knew that if he began to allow Paul to end on what was going in, going on that Paul would begin to pray and intercede on behalf of this ministry and that God would be able to move on behalf of this ministry. See, it's nothing like having some, some individuals in your life that you know that can get a prayer through. See, sometimes we miss it. Sometimes we miss it because we look on the outside. But see, the thing is, we got to look at the heart. We got to know that these are those that God has sent. Those that are willing to go in, my God, and pray and do whatever needs to be done to bring not only correction, but bring progress and bring change, my God. And Paul was a change maker. He was one that brought change. He the one who moved mountains, not because of something of him, but because of the spirit that was in him of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. See, Empress, he had to come to Rome in part to serve Paul during his imprisonment. Amen. You read more about that in Philemon 1 and 23. But also he confided in Paul regarding the dangerous teachings. Amen. And the thing is, these Colossians was allowing these teachers to go into their ear gates. It's very important what we allow what we allow to go into, I need to about to go into our ear gates, amen. Because what we allow to go into our ear gates is what we become. So that's why we gotta understand that things that people are speaking in our ears need to be things that is gonna bring life, that's gonna bring growth, that's gonna bring change, my God, that's gonna push us and thrust us into our purpose and destiny. So, you know, the brother here, he was very disturbed because he knew these teachers was not of God. He knew that these teachers were teaching them about another God. See, he needed to, the Paul to understand that once before they understood the Lord Jesus Christ. They understood that he died for us. They understood that it was Christ that rose from the dead. Amen. And they understood that it was him that brought life. Amen. And gave us a second chance and allowed the grace of God to abound in us more and more. It was this God.
God, this Lord and Savior called Jesus Christ that have brought them from a mighty long way. But see, uh, if it's really thought that these teachers were trying to teach them something else. See, a lot of times we begin to have pride and we make the people feel like it's us that's healing and it's us that's bringing um, deliverance and it's us that's bringing wealth. But the thing is, I hate to bust somebody's bubble. It's not us. Amen. It's the spirit in us that works through us, but it is God Almighty that heals. It is God Almighty that brings wealth. It is God Almighty that brings deliverance. My God, my God, we are just servants. Amen. We're just willing vessels. Amen. That he's able to prevail through because he is spirit, my God. But it is God Almighty, our Lord Jesus Christ, that heals. Amen. So I need to make sure that most people understand that because even as leaders, it can be dangerous because when people begin to come and say, it was you that prayed that for this to happen and it happened and this and that. And you know, we have to be so careful and make sure right then and there when they begin to lift us up, my God, because the king of pride is so sneaky, my God. You got to let them know, no, it was not me. I was just a willing vessel standing here, but it was God Almighty that healed you. It was God Almighty that brought that child when the doctor said that you could not have no children. It was God Almighty that said that you could come into another land. It was God Almighty that gave you that job promotion. It was God Almighty that pulled you out of that situation where you almost lost your mind. It was God Almighty that brought you off the streets when heroin and other drugs almost took you out. My God, it was God that did it. Amen. So we have to be very careful to make sure that we give God back the glory. Why? Because the king of pride, my God, the king of Leviathan is so strong to where we begin to be puffed up. The people of God can quickly puff up leaders. See, you better be careful, leader, making sure that you give it back to God. Amen. See, the most anointed individual that has that healing and then that anointing power within them, you got to be careful because that's one of the things that will take you out. Amen. It's like we, we discussed this like power, money, pride. And if you are a man, woman, if you're not married, if you are a woman, man, if you're not married, amen. Take out a little base. Thank you. So, therefore, I just wanted to tell you that Paul, he sent this letter, along with the letters, amen, to Philemon and to um, the church of Ephesians with Titus, accompanied by one of us, amen. Titus was a co-worker of Paul, amen. See, he also was there to help the Colossians, amen, to understand, amen, to make sure, hallelujah, um, that these teachers would not come into their hearing. Amen. So he was a co-worker of Paul. Amen. Amen. So he was able to make sure that they understood Paul's teaching. See, Paul put together, I believe, was a manual. Amen. Yeah, he put together a study guide. Amen. A Sunday school lesson guide. My God. Intercessory warfare packet guide. My God. How to start up and end up a church. My God. These were manuals, books that Paul put together that even though they came in a letter form, but I, be, I believe and I know because anytime you continue to write a letter after a letter, it begins to pile up and devour you. And if you were smart, you begin to put it like in a book, a manual so you can actually go through it, amen, step by step. And I believe as Paul prepared this menu, amen, um, they were able to have a teaching tool to teach the church of Colossians on how they should be taught, amen. Why? Because the church of Colossians was under attack, amen, from these false teachers who were disintegrating them from the identity of Jesus. Amen. They were teaching that he was not actually God. That's dangerous. You better be careful in making sure that people don't begin to teach you that God is not God. That it was not God that healed you. That it was not God that saved you. Because pastor, you know, a lot of us leaders can make it, make it seem like it was us. Amen. That healed you. That's dangerous. Because it's nothing we can do. 
but it's the spirit and the Christ that's in us, my God, that resurrect, that do what he do. And he delivers. He sets you free. Amen. So they begin to teach them that God was not God. That's dangerous. It was critical to Paul to know that he wanted them to make sure that they understood that it is God. And that there is a true and living God. And that Jesus Christ is our Savior. And that he is our way maker. He is Jehovah. He is Emmanuel, God with us, my God. He wanted to make sure that the, the church understood his greatness and his glory. Amen. He wanted them to understand that he died and then rose from the dead and was resurrected, my God. He was buried. Amen. His death, burial, and resurrection was real. He rose from the dead, even though even the disciples didn't believe. That's why I believe that Mary Magdalene was the first disciple, amen, a real one, because she believed. They walked with him 24 sevens, my God. But when he rose and she came and told them, my God, that's another sermon right there, they did not even believe. But she believed, amen. Why? Because she knew that there was a Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. See, this was so important to Paul. To connect with this church of collision because, see, I told you that Paul never stepped a foot in this ministry. He never even visited them. But it was one of his co laborers, one of his close brethren, if it's intended, that came to tell him what was going on. But he wanted to divinely connect with them in spirit through this letter. Amen. And I'm glad you asked on how was he going to divinely connect? See, Paul needed to present Christ as the center of the universe, not only as an act of creator, but also as a recipient of creation, amen, and taking on human flesh. See, Christ was and he is the visible image of invisible God, containing within himself the fullness of identity, amen. Because of his divine nature, Jesus is seven. Above all things, with giving authority with him by the Father. See, Jesus is also head over the church, my God. He has reconciled all things uh -huh, to himself through his death on the cross, making believers alive to God. Amen. So he is a true and living God and setting them on a path to the right living. Amen. See, the thing is, we must understand that we must understand that. Jesus is not dead, but he's alive. Glory to God. Let's go. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and the Timothy of our brother, my God. There it goes. You see that? It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and the Timothy of our brother. See, I believe now we're getting into his office. Most of the letters that Paul had wrote, even though it identified him as being one of the disciples, in, in a, but this right here is now presenting him as an apostle. See, Paul, an apostle, meaning that, first of all, he was sent. Uh-huh. See, one of the things that really allow us to understand Paul's ministry and his gifting and who he was and the office that God had called him in is because once he understood his calling, he was focused on his mission. And he continued to have this passion to go forth and fulfill the mission that God had given him. See, even as leaders today, even though God had given us a vision, a mission, because sometimes we get discouraged and because things begin to not go the way that we thought it would go, we begin to sometimes give up and give out. But leaders, I'm here to encourage you to let you know that when you are called to this, you are built to last. When you are called to this, that means that God has given you the ability to focus on the mission and the vision that he's given you when he has allowed you to walk in the office of the fivefold ministry that he has called you in. Amen. You can't be an apostle today and nothing tomorrow. You can't be a pastor today and then nothing tomorrow. 
Yes, things get hard, and yes, sometimes the members will stress you out. But the thing is, you got to stay focused on the mission. You got to stay focused on the mission. You got to know that it's not them, but it's a spirit that's behind it. And you got to be able to identify that spirit and go in into prayer and having the Lord Jesus Christ help you fulfill your vision and your mission. Because Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's why whatever office you're walking in, you better make sure that it's of Jesus Christ. And that it's not of me or man. Because man will put you where they want you to be. Or put you where they think you should be. Sometimes because of power, prestige, and money. But the thing is, you better know your office and your calling by your Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? By the will of God, because it is God that graces us and gives us the will to fulfill the office that he has called us into. Because I believe that if it was not because of Jesus Christ, Paul would not have been able to fulfill his mission. Because Paul went to hell, my God. He always looked to his left and right. There was somebody in trying to kill him, my God. It was somebody always trying to bring up his past. Somebody always tried to say that he was a murderer. It was always somebody that tried to bring up something that happened back in 1977. Don't you know that people were always trying to bring back your past? But you got to know that it is what Jesus Christ has given you to do by the will of God. Because if you allow people to paint your picture, see, perception is dangerous because people will imagine where they want you to be or imagine who they want you to be. But see, the thing is, it's not about the perception of people. You better be worried about God. You better be worried about Jesus Christ. How do Jesus see you? Because people will look at us and try to put us in a box. But see, I'm here to let you know on today that we're outside the box because we're walking into our purpose and our destiny on today. Amen? Amen. I can even hear amens in the spirit. Amen. So I'm here to tell you that even in this, my God, my God, Paul began to write the letters. And in every letter that he wrote to the church, Paul always opened up with this. Amen. He always opened up just greeting them. Amen. He always uh, opened up in a letter letting them know how much he loved them. He began to encourage them. My God. See, Paul was sent. But first, Paul was a servant of Jesus Christ. Of Christ Jesus. Why? Because I remember he said that I am the least of the apostles. My God. Even though he was one of the greatest apostles. But he was one of the least of the apostles. He said it out of his own mouth. My God. So nobody didn't even have to do that. He said it because see, he wanted to make sure that pride did not take him over. He said, I'm one of the least, even though he was one of the greatest. My God, my God. He was one of the greatest. And he did not even walk with Jesus. You would have thought the other apostles would have been the greatest. Why? Because they actually walked with Jesus. See, that's how people are. When people walk with us in ministry, you would think it was those individuals that would have our back. Those that walk with us in ministry, you would think it's those individuals that will fulfill the vision, that will know the vision, that will push forth the vision. But I'm here to let you know that sometimes those that even walk close with you in ministry will not push your vision. Matter of fact, they will be the dream killers. They will be the ones that say you can't do it. But it's those, my God, my God, that don't even walk with you, but know that there's a true living God that will support you. Amen? So, Paul, he was sent. My God. He was a servant. Uh-huh. Because in the other one, here in Romans 1, it said Paul is serving of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Romans 1 and 1, it says Paul, a servant. See, he first said, hey, I'm a servant. See, y'all, I need y'all to understand. See, y'all that want to be such bishops and chief bishops and arch bishops and apostles and I hate to tell you, it's just a five-fold ministry. The apostle, the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist, and the prophet. My God, there's no chief, there's no arch, there's no nothing, there's no elect. It's, it's, it is what it is. It's in the word, amen. It is what it is. But I'm here to tell you that Romans 1 and 1, Paul, a servant first. We must 
be a servant. See, the thing is, you got to be willing to serve than to be served. Most of the time, because we're an apostle, or most of the time we are a pastor, we feel like we're somebody big. We just sit down here on the on the poor pit, and we want people to serve us. But try this one day. Why don't you serve the people? Why don't you stand at the door and usher the door? Why don't you come in sometimes and clean the church? Why don't you do some things that you would expect your auxiliary worker to do? Amen. Why? Because we are serving first, my God. See, the thing is, if you don't know how to serve, and you're not willing to serve, you're not great at any of the that you, that you say that you are. Why? Because you're not a servant. You need to be a servant of our Christ and Jesus, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why? Then, once you're able to be a servant, then now you can be called into the fivefold. You can see in Romans 1 and 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, then he was called to being an apostle. Meaning he was called into the office by God to fulfill the purpose and destiny. And then he was set apart for the gospel of God. Not the gospel of himself, not the gospel to make himself big or to have a title for prestige or power or money, but of God, my God. So before he was able to walk in the office, first he had to be a servant. Then he was walking in the office of an apostle. He was set apart. How was he set apart, apostle? That means that he was set apart for the master use by God. He was set apart to learn the more of the things of God, to be able to serve God at a greater level, at another level, my God. Set apart from those heresies and those false teachers and those even some of those apostles, um, those disciples that begin to take one foot in and one foot out. My God, he was set apart. Why? Because he needed to fulfill the purpose and destiny. My God. See, we ain't gonna zoom too quick into this book because we're gonna understand the identity of Jesus. My God, we're gonna understand his sovereignty. We're gonna understand who he is. Amen. See, Paul was called an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. It was God's will that brought him through the road of Damascus. It was by God's grace that allowed him to be taken up in the third heaven. My God, he didn't even walk with Jesus, but he had the ability and he had the privilege to be taken up in the third heaven. In a place where those that have walked close with Jesus never had an opportunity to go up. So he understood how valuable and how serious this calling was. Amen. For God to take him up. Amen. After he had crucified Christians. After he had did all the things that he had done. Little old me, he said. God giving me a second chance. I got to do this right. Amen. But Paul was not perfect, God. He had still his opinions, amen, but he did not let his opinions overtake him, amen. See, the thing is, he was sent. See, you got to be sent by God. You can't just go, because when you just go, things don't happen. Why? Because it's your own, own will. You got to be sent. See, an apostle is not just having big churches. An apostle is not just having buildings that you feel that's dedicated up under you. See, the thing is, these merely builders will fade away. But when you sit, you're bringing change. You're changing, a, you're changing governments. You, you walk you, you walk in authority and bringing change in the church. Amen. Not just the building, but the people. Because we are the church. Amen. But we're not to come in and take over the church. Amen. We're to build the vision of the church. The Lord gave the pastor the vision. We're to push the vision. We're to help the vision. We're to support the vision. And we're supposed to bring correction and even rebuke in love just to make sure that the vision is being going forth. Amen. And then we're off to another place. Amen. We ain't got time to spend time in one place. There's other ministries that need help, my God. But we get so caught up in the limelight. But the thing is, there's so many other ministries hurting. See, how can we call ourselves apostles being sick and all these churches are in di distress? All these churches are not even doing what they're called to do. It is our job as apostles to go in and to help the ministry to bring them forward so that they can fulfill the purpose and destiny and vision that God has given them. Amen. See, one thing I want you to understand is that when you know that you are 
called and that you're walking in your calling and fulfilling it to the greatest of our Lord Jesus Christ is how healthy is your flock? How healthy is those that you've been sent to? How healthy is those churches that you say is under you? How healthy are they? Amen. See, the thing is, it's not just the building. See, when you're being sent, you're being sent to bring change, to lift up the ministry that God has sent you to. He was a sick one. Amen. See, he wanted them to understand that it was only by the will of God. See, he could have been in his own will, went to the church of Colossians. But he was not sick at that time. See, that's why you got to know time and season. Because there's a time when God is going to do things over here. And there's a time when God is going to do things over there. But you got to be in the right position to know when and how and where to go. So Paul, even though he was in prison, he was in the right place. Because see, if he wasn't in prison, he would have been over somewhere else doing ministry. You see, one thing about Paul, he did not stop. Pastor, he kept going and going like the bunny, kept going and going. He was better than the energizing bunny. Amen. Because he kept going and going on about the gospel. So even in this time of his imprisonment, he had a brother that came to him and to say, you know what? Could you please take time out? I need you to write this letter. Matter of fact, I know when you begin to write your letters that your letters become a book, your letters become a manual, your letters become a book of instruction. This church of Colossians need help because these false teachers are teaching heresy. They're teaching that there is no God. My God. So Paul was sent. Amen. He understood many. Amen. See, he knew his calling and his mission in life. God designed him to fulfill it. He gave him the right characteristics the desire and the passion and the drive to fulfill the mission. See, God will give you that right passion, the drive, and the characteristics that you need to fulfill the vision. But the thing is, when you begin to write your own vision and go and do your own vision, then it can't be fulfilled. Why? Because it's not of the will of God. That's why your vision has to be the will of God. It has to be His purpose, His destiny, His mission. So that he can fulfill it, that he can thrust it for, so that he can be prosperous. Amen. Paul understood these things. Amen. See, Paul understood the mysteries of the gospel. See, one thing we must understand, leaders, we must understand spiritual things. Most of the time, we don't understand spiritual things. Why? Because we don't pray. We pray for 15 minutes, 20 minutes. We may pray for a day. We need to stop praying. Let me tell you something, leaders. We supposed to pray every day, all day, without ceasing. Why? Because when we pray, we connect with God, my God, the true vine. Then he began to download the mystery of the gospel. He began to download the revelation, my God. Then we're able to discern the times. We're able to discern the spirits that are operating, my God. Everybody ain't doing witchcraft because they understand spiritual things. They know witchcraft, amen. But we operate in the witchcraft when we are disobedient to the things of God. And leaders, we must understand spiritual things because when we even think of that we don't even do witchcraft, we are doing it. Why? Because we're walking out of the uh, we're not walking in obedience. And you're walking in disobedience when you're not fulfilling the vision. When you're not praying without ceasing. When you're not understanding spiritual things. When you're, oh my God, a lot of us leaders don't even understand that we're walking out of the will of God but we feel like we're right there. We feel like we're, we're doing But see, the thing is, you need to do an inventory check on yourself to make sure that you are doing what you're supposed to be doing. Because if you are not, you are walking in disobedience, and that's witchcraft. Amen? See, we want to look at witchcraft as what we want to see. But see, the thing is, witchcraft is disobedience. It is one of the things that I did about witchcraft. Amen? So you must understand that in order for you to be set apart, and to walk in the office that God has called you to walk in, you have to first be obedient to the things of God. Even though you may not feel like you want to go to that member's house. See, a lot of times we only go to our member's houses when there's a death or there's sickness. But do you just pop up just to say, how you doing? Are you in the spirit to see, to discern that they may not have no food? 
Christ, you and the Spirit to discern that they may just need a visit of encouragement. But we get so caught up, they got to get on our schedule, they got to book an appointment, they got to wait. Let me tell you something, it may be too late. So you got to avail yourself now. Amen. Hallelujah. So he was sent, my God. See, Paul knew that he was sent. He was created to what? My God. To take over. He had a takeover anointing. Not because he wanted it, but because God gave it to him, because God knew he could trust him. He had a takeover anointing. He he he, he like, like a revolutionized anointing. He revolutionized the world in ministry. We need to be revolutionizing the world because there are souls, my God, that are lost. Amen. By the will of God. I told y'all we're going to break down this because by the time we're done with this book of Colossians, my God, we're going we, 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 we go somewhere, y'all. And by the will of God, because see, we're out of the will of God. I know you're like, well, why are you spending so much time on this one? Because we need to understand Paul, his, his positioning here, his, 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 his office here, and, and, and who called him into this office, and, and, and by whose will, amen, amen. And then there was a witness by his brother and Timothy, amen. Hallelujah. So it was he was sent by the will of God. I told you, he was a sent one. Amen. Yes, he was a sent one. Amen. See, he was he set an example for many. Amen. See, God gave him such a gracious design to move through things grace, gracefully. Amen. Rather than to determine to resolve it on his own but to move through things gracefully. So he had a graceful design to move through things, amen. See, God gracefully designed us in a way to make sure that we're walking in a specific calling that he called us in. He does not make us do or determine the outcome. Rather, he delights in seeing us operating in the thing that he called us into because he called us into it. We did not walk into it. He called us into it. Don't you know most of the time we're called into it through our experiences, through our hurt, through our pain, through sometimes almost losing our life, my God. That's how you know that it's the will of God. He has designed us. That's why in Romans 12 and 2 it says, do not be conforming wrong to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good and pleasing and perfect will. Because if you do not transform your mind, my God, renew your mind, you won't be able to see the will of God. You won't be able to please him or walk into his perfect will. Y'all, we need to be able to, first of all, we got to really reform our mind before we transform our mind. Because see, we got a lot of mess and junk Tradition, religion, dog, and some old heresy and old things that's not even of God in our mind, in our heart. So we got to reform our mind first. Take out the old, empty it out. So then it's empty. Because you can't put new wine in old wine. And then you're able to transform meaning, renewing it with the things of God, with spiritual things, with the mysteries, the hidden secrets of God. The revelation of God and able to walk into your calling of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, if you're unsure of your calling, you need to ask God. You don't need to ask me. Even though God, yes, as his prophet, he gives us uh, ability to see, but it is God Almighty who first assures you of your calling. All he does with the man and woman of God is uses us to activate to encourage, to, to push forth your calling. Amen. Because most of the time we are born with it. Amen. Most of us are born leaders. Most of us are born gifted. It ain't something somebody can teach you. It ain't something somebody can just give you. You can't even get the education for it. But yes, you can, you, 
you can, even when you got it, you do go through different trainings and you go through different teachers and things to help incorporate so that it can be fine-tuned to a level to where you're able to master it. So you need to master your calling. Amen. Because when you're able to master your calling, then others will be able to come. It's like a master key. A master key allows you to copy it and it will go into any door. Amen. See, the thing is, he has designed you for his purpose. And in order for you to begin to discover and walk into your calling, you first need not to first be to be conformed to the patterns of this world, but to first transform. I said first reform and transform how by renewing your mind. Renew your mind. Amen. So that the will of God, the will, amen. But well, we're going to go ahead. I know you're like, wow, you didn't even get out for one. But you know what? Because we're going to break this down. This is really good. And the Spirit of God told me that the book of Colossians, let me tell you, this is not a book that you're going to run right through. Because this book here is a book that's really going to get us to walk in the will of God. That's going to understand our calling, going to understand why we do what we do. And to understand really who Jesus is. Amen. His supremacy. Amen. The supremacy of Christ. Amen. And why he did what he did for us. Amen. So we're going to move right on here on our Sunday service. Amen. And I just thank the Lord for you. Amen. I thank the Lord for those that have came out today. We're going to have a great service. We're going to um, cut it a little short today. But I believe that Pastor will have a great word for us today. Could you give me a little um, echo off? Amen. I'm like it too. Uh, hello? Amen. Yes. So I know it's going to be a great um, sermon today. So we're going to move into our, our, our service now. And we're going to start our service a little earlier today. So we're just moving right on in. So I welcome you to um, Unlimited Grace Prayer Ministry, where our overseer um, and the angel of this house, and we're grateful to have him, is Pastor Joe L. As a morning man, he is a servant of God. Actually, he walks in the fivefold ministry, apostle, pastor, teacher, prophet, evangelist. Amen. But Pastor, one thing about him, he's very humble. He, you know, even though he, he know that God had graced him to walk in the fivefold, but he's not into, you know, having for his office to be represented because he know that this season, in this timing, here at Unlimited Grace, that God had called him to pastor. Amen. So he walks as a pastor and also he understands spiritual things as a prophet. Amen. And teaches as a teacher. Amen. So we thank God. He evangelized like an evangelist, my God. Oh, he's an evangelist. Let me tell you, he evangelized the world. He's downtown, Westwood, with in Terrace, my God. He's from God, my God. Most of us know sometimes they we, we don't travel far, but this evangelist, amen, he's all the way over in Fort Thomas, New Burlington, Kentucky, my God, Dayton, Columbus, Jesus Christ, Avondale, Anderson, wherever the Lord send this man of God, he's there. Amen. And he's not only coming with power and authority through our Lord Jesus Christ, but he's coming with something that you're never going to thirst or hunger again. And I ain't just talking about the word of God, but this man got over 15,000 bottles of water as well. Amen. To evangelize. And it ain't just regular water, but it's some flavor water, some watermelon and orange and lemon lime. Yes, my God. So if you are in need of water, you can always call us, amen, and if we could be a help to you to do some evangelistic work in your ministry, we'd love to meet with you. Um, you can call us at 513-642-9510. God bless you. And we thank you for joining us that's listening. Um, we thank our Unlimited Grace Prayer Ministry family that's here, and we thank Unlimited Grace Prayer Ministry um, we want to thank those that have tuned in, not just on social media platforms for iHeartRadio and other uh, platforms that are here. We just thank God for you because we believe that it is God, our Lord and Savior, that has brought us through and that he is the only one that continues to bring us through. And we live and we focus.
focus and make sure that it is our Lord and Jesus Christ that does everything for us. It's not our will, but it is his will. Amen. Amen. So we just want to welcome you. We welcome you. We welcome you. Why? Because Jesus loves you. Jesus loved you first. Amen. And we love you as well. Amen. But guess what? It is Jesus that loves you. So let's go ahead and open in prayer. We're going to go ahead and start our service. We're going to open up the scripture as well. Amen. Hallelujah. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you. We thank you. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. We thank you for today. We thank you, O oh God, that this sermon on today that's coming from the man of God will be a good word that falls on good ground. We thank you, O oh God, for the service, O oh God, that will take place. We thank you, O oh God, for all of those, O oh God, that will give not only their tithes and offering, but their time, O oh God, and their giftings, O oh God, for your glory. God, allow souls, O oh God, to come in, O oh God. Allow your deliverance power, O oh God, to take over this place. We call it the kingdom of glory to take over. We call it the King of glory, our Lord Jesus Christ, to stand before us and to do it all in his name. Amen and glory to God. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go on with the scripture reading. Psalms 100. It says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. I'm going to make a joyful noise. That means that I'm going to Shabbat, my Lord and Savior. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. We're going to serve the Lord with gladness. Even when we don't feel like we're going to serve him with gladness, Pastor. We're going to come before his path and presence with singing. Even though I may can't sing that the way you want me to sing, but I'm going to come to his presence singing. Amen. I know ye that the Lord is good God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastors. My God. We know ye that the Lord, he is God. Yes, we do. We just studied that in the book of Colossians that nobody can come and tell us that he's not God because he's God Almighty. He's our Jehovah Jireh, our Emmanuel. God is with us, my God. So we know that the Lord, he is our God. It is he that has made us and not ourselves. We are his people. We're not their people, but we are God's people. Yes, we are God's people. We are blessed. We are blessed and highly favored, my God. And we are the sheep of his pastures because he has led us through green pastures, my God, and by the still waters, my God, for his name's sake. We're going to enter into his gates with thanksgiving, my God. Enter into a court with praise. Let's give him a praise. Be thankful to him and bless his holy name. We're going to bless him in the good times. We're going to bless him in the bad times. We're going to bless him coming in. We're going to bless him coming out. We're going to give him thanks coming in the gate. We're going to give him thanks coming in the course, my God. We're going to praise him. We're going to Shabbat him. We're going to give him all the glory. Why? Because he is our Lord and Savior. He is Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Nisi and El Shaddai. God Almighty, my God. We're going to bless his heavenly name. His name is heavenly above all names. Every knee got to bow and every tongue that can confess that he is our Lord and Savior, my God. I'm excited right now. What about you? Because we have entered through the gates with Thanksgiving. We're now into the court with praise. We're in the sanctuary. Giving him all the glory, all the praise. We're blessing his name. For the Lord is good. My God. The Lord is good. Pastor, is the Lord good to you? Hey, hey, Joyce, is the Lord good to you? Hey, I don't know about you, but the Lord is good to me. He's been good to me over and over and over. He's been good to my family. He's been good to my children. He has been good to those that he has seen me to seek and pray. Oh, my God. He is good. He is worthy to be praised. Even though if he may not have did it yet, I know that it's coming. He is good. He brought me out of nowhere. He brought me from under a rock, my God. He set my feet on a solid rock, my God. I know my God is good. He's good all the time. His mercy, oh my God, the mercy of God, the grace of God is everlasting, my God, and his truth endures to all generations, my God. Jesus. So now we're going to start with praise and worship. We're going to call Pastor, amen, 
Thank you, Jesus. Invisible God, invisible God, invisible 
whether there is instrumentalist or no, or, or no instrument or, or whatever it takes, they worship God in truth and in spirit. Hallelujah. I want you to worship God in truth and in spirit. Uh, bless his name for what he has done for you. Uh, for the great things that he has done. For the provisions that he has provided you. For the health and, and the protection and the guidance that he has given you. Uh, begin to bless the name of the living God Jesus right now. Christ bless the name of the living God. Uh, bless the name of the living God. Bless the name of the living God. Bless the name of the living God. And magnify the name of the living Lord. For he alone is worthy of our prayer. He is worthy of our prayer. Give you the and I give you all the glory. There is none like you, my King. What a mighty God. My Redeemer. Jesus. What a mighty God. We Thank you. 
Yeah. 
or asking with the wrong motive. Hallelujah. Asking with the wrong motive. That is James chapter 4, verse 3. And first Peter chapter 3, verse 7, verse 7 talks about treating your wife in an inconsiderate behavior or treating your husband in an inconsiderate behavior. And we talk about doing evil. First Peter chapter 3, verse 12. Hallelujah. And we also talk about first Peter chapter 4, verse 7. The, uh, having a flippant attitude, meaning that not being serious with the things of God, taking the things of God for granted. Amen. Being too familiar with the, with, with the man of God or the, the things of God. Amen. And then um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 5 to 6, talks about hypocritical attention. Hallelujah. You are praying because you want people to have attention, to know that you can also pray for, for some other reasons. Maybe you want to be appointed as a leader. Maybe you want some. You need to be approved that you are also good in prayer. So for some other reasons, you are praying to get people attention, for people to know that you can also pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And we also said that using vain repetition, hallelujah, using, using vain repetition in prayer. When you are praying, you should be specific in your prayers. Be specific in your prayers. Tell God what you want. You can pray that God bless me, God bless me, God bless me, God bless me. God can bless you. But in your mind, you, you want God to bless you, maybe financially, you want God to bless you. You're married, but you are praying that God bless me, God bless me, God bless me. And God bless you pertaining to your, your, your marriage. But maybe in your mind, you are praying about God blessing you about your finances. Hallelujah. And so we should be specific in prayer. Vain repetition or empty repetition, we should not... Um, be repeating words without meaning, words without meaning, uh, words without power. No, uh, I'm not speaking about tongues, hallelujah. Tongues has meaning, hallelujah. It is only those who uh, understand, it's only spiritual people that are able to discern spiritual things, hallelujah. Ten tongues has meaning. So um, don't let anyone deceive you, but I'm talking about empty repetitions, words without meaning, words, empty phrases, phrases that are not. Um, um, that does not come together, that does not form any or, or give you any reason. It's not logic. It's, it does not make any sentence. Hallelujah. Let's avoid those sentences in our prayer. Amen. Amen. And we said a lack of unity. Lack of unity. Sometimes we need to come together and then pray. If we are not united enough, if we are not together, sometimes it becomes hard for our prayers to be answered, but when we become of one accord, it is easy. The Bible says that one shall chase a thousand, but two shall chase ten thousand. Amen. And we said that that is where we ended last week. We said that some situations need fasting and then prayers, and that is where we are going to pick it from. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 9, verse 29. Amen. Mark chapter 9, verse 29. Where is the, my projector? This thing projected on the um, this thing, hallelujah. Mark chapter 9, verse 29 says that um, there are some issues that demand um, fasting and then um, prayers. Amen. There are some issues that demand fasting and prayers. Some things that you need to fast and pray about it, hallelujah, before God answers your prayer. And I was saying that Jesus did not wait for the problem to come before he fasted and then he prayed. When you are in problems, you need to fast and pray that God, that God will deliver you from your problems. But the best way is to fast and pray that the Lord will, will not lead you into temptation. Hallelujah. The Bible says that when we pray, we should pray that the Lord should not lead us into temptations. Amen. The Lord should not lead us into temptations. The Lord should not lead us into trials. Amen. And he said unto them, This time come forth by no thing but by prayer and fasting. Amen. So he said that this time come by no thing but through fasting and then, and then prayers. So there are certain things that we can overcome. There are certain challenges that we can overcome through fasting and then prayers. Amen. 
and we said that most people don't pray in the, um, especially pastors and when they see their fellow pastors progressing in life and they see their fellow pastors God is using them in, in other areas and other aspects then they begin to um, fight against them instead of them fasting and praying for God to use them in, in their area in their field for them, God to equip them in their area they don't fast and pray but when um, others fast and pray and, and they are being equipped, they become jealous of it and they will be like, oh, it's witchcraft, hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. We need to fast and pray as believers. It's, 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 it's a must that as believers we need to fast and then pray. We don't have to wait until we are going into problems, until we are going into um, situations. We need to at least once in a week or twice in a week um, fast and then pray for the Lord to protect us, for the Lord to guide us. We shouldn't wait till everything is, 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 is messed up before we try to come to God and say, God, we need your deliverance, we need your healing, we need your, your power, hallelujah. You know, when, you, when something is destroyed, it is hard for you to rebuild it. But when um, you are protecting something, um, it's easy to protect something than to build and then, and then protect it. Hallelujah. So let us protect ourselves um, through fasting and prayers. Let us pray and seek for the face of God. Amen. There are certain things that we cannot do, but except that we avail ourselves and then fast and then, then, and then pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And seek for the face of God. Amen. Amen. We need to fast and pray. And the next one is Mark chapter 11, verse 25 to 26. Unforgiveness. Amen. Amen. Mark chapter 11, verse 25 to 26. Unforgiveness. When we do not forgive, when we do not forgive our brothers or our sisters, it becomes hard for us to be able to forgive. Forgiving by God. Amen. He says that, and when ye stand praying for thee, if ye have ought against him, that ye, that your father also which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Amen. Amen. Some of us, if any new person comes to the church, and we get closer to the person, We laugh with everybody in the church. We talk with everybody in the church. But when any new person comes in the church, that person must know what Kuku Mensah did to you, what a that did to you, what a Kuku did to you, and everything that they did to you. Hallelujah. And when you do that, you have not really forgiven the person. Amen. Even though you are smiling with the people, but you have not forgiven them. You know, it's different saying that I'm forgiving you and really forgiving somebody. Amen. If you have truly forgiven me, why are you bringing it back up? Not even to me, but to somebody. Sowing a discord in that person's life. So the next time that person comes to church, he is perceiving me as a bad person. He is perceiving the next person as a bad person. Something that the same person that is saying that he has forgiven, but he is using this as a weapon to tear the church apart. Amen. And if you do that, do you expect that when you come to church and you pray, the Lord will answer your prayers? Amen. There is a need for us to forgive. We are always having issues. 
Whenever we have new friends, everything that our husband has done to us, 10 years, 20 years, 5 years, when we got married, my husband did this, my husband did that, my wife did this, my wife did that. Then it becomes a platform for the enemy to come into your marriage. Hallelujah. If you are truly forgiving your husband, if you are truly forgiving your wife, you not bring it back up. Not to him, but to your friends. Hallelujah. Not to him, but to your pastors. Amen. Some of us, it is our own acts. The way we do and the way we present our husbands, that make other people feel like, oh, there is a way there. I can go in and snatch the husband. I can go in and snatch the wife. Amen. Amen. The moment you begin to tell your friend about the thing that your husband has done for you against you three years, two years ago, that you have sat down with your husband and settled it, you are still complaining to your friends. Amen. So it makes people that are jealous of your marriage, it makes them feel like, oh, there is, there is, there is, there is problem in their marriage, so I can, I can use this problem to go through their marriage. And break their marriage. Hallelujah. Forgiveness. When we say that we are forgiven, we should, we should, we should, we should portray, we should, we should let it reflect on our character. Amen. We sit down, we talk, you know. In a church, people have issues. You talk to people, people have issues, you sit them down, you talk with them, you say, oh, greet each other, and they greet each other, and they say to themselves, oh, we are forgiving each other. But yes, yeah, still, they did that in front of the pastor in order not to disrespect the pastor or disrespect the person that is settling the case. But when they move from there, they still see each other Jesus. with different eyes. The way they speak to each other is like they are not in common terms. But at the same time, when they come before the pastor, they want the pastor to know that, oh, pastor, what you said, that we should be one, we are one. Who are you deceiving? You want to prove to your pastor that you are one, but you can't prove to God. God see, If I don't see you, God sees you. Amen. If I do not see you, God sees you. You are still harboring it in your heart. And if every visitor comes to the church, he will know it. Oh... When I was doing this, pastor did me this. When I was doing that, Kwekumenu did me this. Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. So, the newcomer that has come to the church, will be like, hey, so this church, I was thinking this church, uh, the church that I'm coming from, there's the same problem that I'm running from. Yes. Look, the same problem that I'm coming to. Yes. Yes. Issue that have been settled in the church. Then, the newcomer is backing off. He is going. What you said, even though you're not in your mind, you did not say it for him to go back. But it's what you said that has created doubt in his mind for him to go back. The Bible says that offenses must come, but woe to those that it will come through. Amen. So, because maybe God brought a person into the house for the, him to, to be delivered in certain areas, but because of what you said, yes. that person has gone back. And you are expecting that you will come to God. Amen. Amen. Some of us, 
We always complain about our friends. Amen. And my friend this, this, and my friend did that, but we are still working with them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Amen. If you feel like he's not a good friend, leave him alone. If you can't forgive him, let him go. Why are you harboring? Why uh, the little thing that your friend did uh, against you, you are harboring it in your heart? You can't forgive him. You are always complaining about it. Amen. Amen. Why is it that the little thing that happened in your church? Somebody will say, "This my pastor. This thing is not little. You don't know what I went through." Amen. But in spite of our sinful nature, God forgave us and sent forth his son to come and die for us. But we are not willing to forgive our friends. Amen. If we do not forgive, it becomes hard. I always tell you. Jesus said that when you are, you are, coming, to sow, uh, you are coming to present your offering before God. And you remember that you have an issue with somebody. Go and settle with a person before you come. This is when you are going to present something to God. So when you are going to ask something from God and remember that you have an issue with somebody, what will you do? Amen. Amen. If he is not willing to accept your gift, you think he will be willing to grant you your request if you are having an issue with somebody. Amen. There is a need for us to come before God with a pure heart and a forgiving mind. Amen. When we don't learn to forgive and we, we, we harbor it in our hearts, it brings division. It brings offenses. Hallelujah. It brings stress, depression, Amen. So let us learn to forgive each other. When we do not forgive, we don't forgive people. It is hard to come to the presence of God and receive something from God. Amen. Do unto others as you want others to do unto you. If somebody sin against you, if somebody does evil against you, Put yourself in that person's position. That if I was the one that did this thing against that person, will I be willing to be forgiven? Will I be willing that the person will not go around destroying my name? Hallelujah. And keep it to himself and then forgive me. If you will be willing that that person will do that for you. Then do the same thing to the person. Amen. 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 Sometimes we talk too much. Amen. And the more we talk about the issues, the more we talk about the, the, the things that people have done for us, the more it creates pain and bitterness in our hearts. Amen. Amen. We should learn to forgive. Unforgiveness. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Lack of persistence. Amen. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Lack of persistence. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Talks about a widow. Amen. A widow that had an issue that wanted a judge to deal for him. And the widow persistently went to the judge every time, every minute, every second. Sometimes we easily give up. When you read the book of Daniel, Daniel was fasting and praying. And the Bible says that the first day that he made up his mind that he was going to pray, the Lord answered his prayer. Amen. 
But the prince of Persia withstood those blessings. When the prince of Persia withstood those blessings, God has to send his angels to fight on behalf of And it took 21 days for the angel to come down and tell Daniel that the Lord has answered your prayer. Daniel could have given up the first week. Daniel could have given up the second day. Daniel could have given up the second week. Daniel could have given up on the tenth day. Hallelujah. But Daniel never gave up. He persisted. He was persistent in prayer. Some of us, we have certain issues that we are praying and expecting God to bring or answer us. Amen. But when we pray about it today, it takes another year for us to pray about it. Amen. Maybe you are expecting that God gives you or grant you opportunity or your request may be granted for your green card or for a job and you prayed about it today that Lord grant me a, a job, hallelujah. And Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you don't have any job. Then you sit down, not doing anything, and you come back in three weeks' time and then pray that God give me a job. Then you go back, you don't do anything. Then in another three weeks, or maybe two days' time, you come and pray. That is not how it works. Amen. That is not how prayer works. We should be persistent in prayer. The Bible says that man always ought to pray without seasoning. Amen. And Jesus said that we should pray that we do not enter into temptations. He said that when you pray, you should pray that give us our daily bread. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, when, when, when our, some, some of us we pray through our emotions, when our emotions is telling us that, oh, we need to pray, this, this, this thing cannot be, when, when we feel sad, that is when we pray. When we feel that things are becoming tough in our life, that is when we pray. When we feel like this thing, is, it, it can never be possible, that is when we pray. When we feel like there is, a, there, is a, there is an attack on our life, that is when we pray. When we feel like there is an attack on our finances, that is when we pray. Amen. But the Bible says that we should watch and pray that we enter not into temptations. Amen. Amen. Don't wait till you feel like something bad is about to happen until you pray about your marriage to be secured. Amen. Amen. Now that your marriage is going on, everything is calm, everything is smooth, you don't even feel like praying for the Lord to protect your marriage. And when issues begin to pop up in your marriage, that is when you begin to pray. Amen. Amen. When issues begin to pop up in your education, that is when you begin to pray about your education. Some of us, we never pray about educations. Hallelujah. So as we never pray about our job. Hallelujah. When, when somebody begins to gossip about us at the workplace, that is when we begin to pray that God should protect us. Amen. Amen. But we ought to pray without seasoning. We should pray always. It's, it should be, prayer should be part of us. Amen. When we see a necessity for us to present ourselves to God, not only ourselves, but present our, our, our giftings, everything that we have, our children, our job, and everything. There is a need for us to present it to God day by day, night by night. Every, every time, every second, every opportunity that we have, there is a need for us to present whatever that we have to God, for God to take care of it. Amen. Because the devil is sneaky. The devil is very sneaky. And the devil is, will always sneak out to come in and destroy what you are built. So always and always make sure that you are persistent in prayer by committing your ways and your thoughts, your marriage, your family, your, your children to God. Hallelujah. Don't wait till your children are, are, are in trouble 
And you, be, you come to God and pray for your children, for God to deliver your children from trouble. Amen. But pray that the Lord will deliver your children out of troubles, even when they are not in troubles. Amen. So we should be persistent in prayer. We don't pray one, one kind of prayer today and then just let it be. Oh, we are afraid, so God has answered our prayer. No. We should be persistent in prayer until we still we see the manifestations of it. We should be persistent in prayer until we see the manifestations of it. Amen. For we would like to end here with our sermon. But if you did not hear anything, if you forget anything, remember that we should be persistent in prayer and be forgiving to each other. Amen. Stand on your feet. You are wonderful. You are worthy of all. You